very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here. I am Devulina from Clarnet. We are very much proud to be associated as a digital partner for this session. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME and doctors generated medical content platform. So now without much delay, now I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Radha Krishnan sir for the next proceedings. Over to you sir. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and good evening to all. Welcome to the Wednesday evening webinar of Indian College of Anesthesiology. This webinar is going on since last 22 months, and we will be hitting the 100 mark very soon. And this webinar is created for equitable distribution of academics to all our colleagues, whether students, practitioners, or learners. And today's webinar is on something which we know very well, but still continues as a baffling problem, as well as where we would like to hear more on the current aspects. So today we will be discussing the brain deaths and what assessment we practice, how to go systematic on the assessment, and how you should document how we could confirm the brain death and what are the protocols followed in India today. And after that, the panelists will be discussing how we are going to maintain a brain dead for organ retrieval, as well as, well, they will touch on the euthanasia applicable in a brain dead patient in India. So today's webinar is handled by senior consultant and director of transplant anesthesia at Medanda Medicity Hospital, Dr. Vijay Wara. And his team members are Harsh Jawari, Prachi Gowla, Seema Balotra, Richa Singh, and Archana. And our anger, as usual, Devol Nasir Khan. Before I hand over to Vijay, I request Dr. Jayashree Sood, our Chief Executive Officer, to say a word about the ICA and how we are progressing before you hand over to Vijay. Jayashree. I think the issue cannot be communicated now. So I request Vijay Vora to go ahead. The issue will come sometime later during the middle of our webinar. Okay. Vijay, please start. Please unmute. Vijay, ah. yeah. Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Radha Krishnan has already given an introduction. So we're going to talk about brain death certification, organ donation, issues around it, legal, uh, administrative. We have a noto specialist also, also there. So this is how the program is going to pan out. I'll give a brief introduction. Then Prachi comes in, talks about brain death certification. Then Dr. Seema Balotra talks about management of brain death donor. Then law and the legal issues in organ donation by Dr. Harsh Jauri. And then finally, we will all sit together and put some questions to the panel 
and uh, and especially Dr. Richa Singh, who handles the legal issues for us in Medanta. You see, organ donation, if you look at this graph, starting from 2012, the top one is, the red one is for the kidneys, and then the liver and, and the other organs. So having said that, we have made some progress. You know, we are increasing uh, transplantation activity in this country. But is that enough? If you look at this graph, global graph, you know, right on top is Spain, uh, where they do about 40 patients per million is the organ donation. And where is India? Really very dismal. And this has not changed from 2016. And this is the graph for 2019. This is all global graph, uh, graph in countries who do more than 100 transplants. I mean, with numbers, if you see, absolute numbers have gone from uh, 7,000 to 12,000, but still it's not good enough. You can pat yourself on the back. 2013, there were 313 donations. 2017, 905. I mean, you know, you increase threefold, but threefold really, it's really with the kind of population we have, uh, we really need to do more. This is, like I said, we do only 0.8 per million population is the organ donation and Spain ranks at 46.9. I know catching up with Spain is going to be difficult, but I think we have to make an effort to go somewhere in that direction. See, there are many hurdles, agreed. And each country has gone through processes and slowly developing their program to potential donor, to organ donation, all the way there are problems identifying brain death, screening donor organs, approaching family, authorization from family, all of them are you know, uh, different processes. So let's do a little bit today. We can't do touch everything today. So let's start off with, first of all, determining brain death. So, Without going any further, I will now invite uh, Prachi Gokula to start her presentation on how do they certify. You know, obviously you have, there is a set system of doing it. So Prachi is going to elaborate uh, on certification of brain death. Prachi, can you come in please? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so now beginning with the webinar, uh, I'll be touching upon the brain death certification as to how, uh, and we'll be discussing these topics under the following heading. The, uh, that's the definition of brain death as the concept of it, the historical background of very brief into the historical claims of how for different uh, criteria have come into uh, the picture. In very, very uh, brief, uh, we'll touch upon transplantation of human organs and tissue act in 1994. That's the legal law for the India. Then declaration of brain death. Then uh, coming on to determination of brain death and uh, special considerations. So with the advent of uh, advancement in cardiopulmonary resuscitation techniques and intensive care management, the concept of brain death have become more favorable as in the concept of uh, death by cardiopulmonary cessation has lost its significance. 
and in the relevance in the context of organ donation the concept of brain death or brain stem death have become even more relevant as we can say so apart from, uh, a lot of criteria are followed to define brain death the few of them is one of them that was given by the uniform determination of death usa in 1981 was when they defined brain death uh, death as either a irreversible cessation of circulatory and pulmonary functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the whole brain including the brain stem which they considered as brain death they uh, emphasize that determination of death must be made in accordance with the accepted medical standards although they did not throw in uh, they did not establish as to what Uh, accepted medical standards they were discussing about so later on american academy of neurology guidelines on brain death in 1995 uh, gave us the uh, parameters as to on which we could establish brain death and they defined it as an irreversible loss of entire brain including the brain stem that has to be demonstrated by complete loss of first consciousness that's coma the loss of brain stem reflexes and lastly the loss of independent capacity for ventilatory drive that is apnea and all these conditions had to be fulfilled in the absence of any factors that may possibly imply reversibility in this they did mention that neurocrine and uh, neuroendocrine functions may persist in patients despite a reversible injury to brain and brain stem so therefore if patients do present uh, with the uh, diabetes insipidus it is in uh, it is consistent with the concept of brain death they mentioned about ancillary testing but only as a surrogate means of assessment in patients where either because of some reason we were not able to perform the brain stem reflexes test or in patients where the uh, the tests were inconclusive Uh, for them the irreversibility they define as the impossibility of recovery regardless of any medical intervention for any duration of time and therefore it was important to differentiate brain stem from other forms of severe brain damage that is vegetative state or a minimally responsive state wherein we expect a patient to recover even if it's after a very prolonged duration of medical care but there is an expectancy of life and that we uh, kind of anticipate in these patients so therefore it was important to uh, confer this irreversibility criteria before assessing for brain death so as now we'll uh, just discuss as to how the brain death criteria came into picture before 1960 the emphasis was only on cessation of cardiopulmonary functions to define death but in 1959 the concept of brain death or death by neurological criteria was first theorized as le coma de passe by molarit ogiolon that means a state beyond coma where they described an apneic comatose patient with uh, without brain stem reflexes or eeg activity this uh, the paper was uh, instrumental in itself to actually come uh, bring to the picture the concept of brain death after this in 1968 a group of harvard faculty proposed the first clinical definition as the harvard brain death criteria they determined uh, they defined brain death as a com- apneic uh, complete loss of brain stem reflexes apneic coma for a period of minimum 24 hours and it had to be validated by a eeg criteria the basic uh, the reason for them to come up with a brain death was more so to avoid prolonging the futility of life support to patients who were not expected to survive because of the brain stem death later on in 1980 the uniform determination of death act came into being where they established a legal basis for neurological determination of death in the usa and as we already discussed that because uddda did not establish any medical parameters that they had that had to be established before assessing for brain death criteria 
American Academy of Neurology in 1995 put forth the guidelines for determination of brain death or death by neurological criteria, which they further on revised in 2010. These were basically evidence-based guidelines or parameters on which a brainstem had to be determined. In 1987, American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force had defined brain death in children, and these guidelines were later on updated in 2011. So although India, uh, India did have few uh, things on brain death, a legal law, as we say, came into being only in 1994, where the Transplantation of Human Organs Act came into being. The purpose of act was basically to regulate the removal, storage, and transplantation of human organs for therapeutic purposes, as well as at the same time, prevent any commercial dealings in human organs. The, this law, when it came into being, was adopted in all states except for J uh, Jammu and Kashmir and Andhra Pradesh, which had their own legislation in place. The act, because of some shortcomings, was amended in 2011, and the amended act was called as Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act 1994. Oh. This, uh, this act recognized brainstem death as a legal act, uh, as a legal form of death in India. So they define brainstem death as a stage at which all functions of brainstem have permanently and irreversibly ceased and is to be certified under subsection six or section that's in TOTA Act. And deceased person was any person in whom there was a permanent disappearance of all evidences of life by reason of brainstem death or in a cardiopulmonary sense at any point of time after live birth has taken place. So who all were supposed authorized to declare a patient brain dead? So brain death certification is done by a panel of four doctors, one being a hospital uh, administrator. The, another is a resident doctor of the hospital wherein the uh, patient is being nursed. Then third is a neurologist, neurosurgeon, physician, intensivist, or anesthetist. And fourth is the treating doctor. Again, the... Uh, intensivist, anesthetist, or physician came into being only in the amended act in 2011. Before that, only a neurologist or a neurosurgeon was authorized to declare a patient brain dead. So now we'll move on to how do we determine a patient is brain dead or not. So before we move on to determining on uh, going about doing all the tests that are required to determine whether he's brain dead or not. There are certain prerequisites that need to be fulfilled. First is evidence of an etiology of coma need to be known. All the confounding factors in terms of metabolic, endocrine, acid-based derangements, intoxication that can be expected need to be excluded. Secondly, core body temperature of the uh, patient should be greater than 36 degrees for 24 to 72 hours. Thereby, the patient should be euthermic, and if needed, warming blankets need to, can be used. Then systolic pressure of the patient should be greater than or equal to 100 mm of Hg. And as already said, all metabolic derangements or endocrine derangements uh, should, be, should be optimized before we move on to the further, uh, we move on to further testing the patient for brain death. That is, sodium levels should be maintained between one, one uh, not to 160 milliequivalents per liter. Serum osmolarity should be less than 350 milliosmoles per kg. Calcium levels less than 12 mg per deciliter. Glucose should be well within a uh, range of 70 to 300 mg per deciliter. pH should be more than 7.2 and alcohol levels should be less than 80 mg per deciliter. And if in cases where we expect that the patient is uh, intoxicated or the patient is under the effect of certain drugs, then maybe waiting for their clearance is uh, advised. If needed, we wait for at least five half lives of, the, uh, of the, the drug to ensure that the drug has possibly cleared out from the patient's body. So once we have fulfilled all the prerequisites that are needed, we move on to three stages. First, we 
proceed with the physical examination of the patient wherein we check the response to pain and at the same time also loss for brainstem reflexes brainstem reflexes again are lost in the rostral to caudal direction and uh, and then after this we move on to the apnea test to further confirm whether the patient is actually brain dead or not apnea test although it is a, again a brain stem test that uh, checks the reflex in medulla oblongata then third is the ancillary test ancillary tests have everywhere been advised only as an optional or a surrogate means of assessment only done in cases where the uh, te brain stem test could not be performed or where they were performed they have been inconclusive so ancillary tests again if needed can be performed in two ways either we detect for cessation of cerebral blood flow or we check for the loss of bioelectrical activity in the brain so first we check for the motor response to pain we ensure that there is no motor response to pain in any distribution of cranial nerve so central pain assessment can be done by applying noxious stimuli to either supraorbital notch the angle of mandible the sternum uh, upper trapezius or anterior axillary folds so no motor response is seen even to the any stimuli on the trunk and although in these patients some spinal reflexes might be present so as commonly called lazarus syndrome uh, reflex sign may be present therefore we need to assess uh, ensure that there are motor responses that are absent and few spinal reflexes might just be present once we have ensured that there is no motor response to pain we move on to the testing of the brain stem reflexes first we check for the pupillary light reflex wherein we check for the second cranial nerve that's the optic nerve and in this light, uh, once the light is thrown the pupils are fixed mid dilated can be 4 to 9 mm in uh, size and they are not responsive to light the second is we move on to the check uh, to check for corneal reflex that is we check for the trigeminal uh, nerve we check with the quartan swab uh, we check for the uh, uh, we touch on the conjunctiva conjunctiva and we check if the patient doesn't blink there is probably a loss of corneal reflex again in this as well we need to ensure that the, we do not touch very lateral of the conjunctiva because that is a relatively insensitive area and might not elicit any response then we move on to the vestibulo ocular reflex or known as the caloric reflex this is to check for the integrity of the vestibular nerve in this normally there is uh, in patients who are brain dead there is no movement of eye after installation of 50 ml of cold water this reflex we wait for 1 minute one of the pre uh, one of the prerequisites is that we uh, make the patient head of the patient uh, bed to at least tilt it to 30 degree so that uh, the semicircular canals are can be stimulated uh, in the most in this position and if we do not observe any eye movement after installation of cold water for 1 minute then and we have to do it in both the ears we wait for 5 minutes before uh, doing it in the other ear and after 5 minutes if we are sure that there was no eye movement we declare it that it's a negative caloric test then we move on to the uh, dolls eye movement or a ocular cephalic uh, reflex wherein we check for the integrity of ocular motor nerve trochlear and abducens nerve normally there is a conjugate deviation of the eyes with the movement of the head but in the absence of any such movement of eyes even when the head is fully rotated to one side implies that the dolls eye is negative again the pre, uh, this test can only be performed when we are sure that there is no fracture or cervical spine is not unstable with this we move on to check for the gag reflex that the glossopharyngeal nerve is tested we stimulate the post uh, bilateral posterior pharyngeal wall and if we do not find in, get any gag uh, reflex then probably it's it shows that the 
uh, that nerve is not is this loss of uh, loss of pharyngeal nerve reflex then like this same we do with the calf reflex we check for the integrity of vagus where we put the suction catheter into the trachea deep enough to stimulate trachea and if we do not are not able to elicit up any calf reflex that again implies that there is a loss of reflex this is again just a summation as to the various th uh, how we assess the patient for integrity of the brain stem moving from consciousness to the various reflexes that we check upon once we have ensured that the patient that uh, all the tests on the brain stem reflexes that we had assessed are negative and there are complete loss then we move to confirmation of the uh, brain death we move on to the apnea testing apnea testing is again done as it helps us to assess the function of medulla basically by allowing carbon dioxide levels to rise enough and the ph to fall enough to maximally stimulate medullary respiratory centers so absence of any respiratory efforts in presence of hypercarbia and acidosis is pretty much consistent with brain death again the care should be taken that this can only be taken uh, can only be done in an intensive care has to be done with the continuous uh, blood pressure and oxygenation monitoring and all other tests are basically consistent with brain death so for the prerequisites again we need to ensure that the patient is euthermic with a minimum of temperature of 36 degrees centigrade is euthermic the systolic blood pressure is of at least 100 mm of hg is eucapnic with the paco2 between 35 to 45 and there is absence of any hypoxia the blood ph of the patient is between normal to low basic and again this test cannot be performed if the patient is under effect of any paralyzing agents so how do we go about doing a apnea test first of all we need to uh, properly preoxygenate the patient for at least 10 minutes with 100% o2 and we need to ensure that we have attained a po2 level of more than 200 mm of hg once we are sure of it we are with the arterial blood gas analysis then we disconnect the patient from ventilator we place a catheter into the endotracheal tube and deliver 100% oxygen at 6 liter per minute the idea is for diffusion oxygenation then we closely look for respiratory movements for at least 8 to 10 minutes respiratory movements are defined as any chest or abdominal excursions patients who have intact brain stem are expected to breathe after few minutes as hypercarbia develops at the rate of 3 mm hg uh, per minute therefore after 8 to 10 minutes we expected to rise at least more than 20 from the baseline levels while we are performing this if at any point of time the systolic blood pressure falls to less than 90 mm of hg or the patient becomes hypoxemic that is with the spo2 of less than 85% for more than 30 seconds we abort the test if needed we optimize the patient and we after optimization after waiting we again resume it so if there is if we are able to complete the apnea test for 8 to 10 minutes and if there is no respiratory drive we repeat the avg after 8 minutes if respiratory movements are absent and arterial pco2 is still 60 mm of hg or more or more than 20 mm of hg above the baseline levels we consider it to be apnea test positive if the test is inconclusive but the patient is hemodynamically stable we may repeat it for a longer duration of time so what are the contraindications again as already mentioned if the patient is hemodynamically unstable we do not take up the uh, test if the patient is hypoxemic with a po2 of less than 90 mm of hg or is in acidosis with a ph of less than 7.2 we do not perform the test again the complications can be hypotension hypoxemia acidosis that may ensue and the cardiac arrhythmias or myocardial ischemia that may ensue because of the following complications 
सो वंस वी हैव इंश्योर दैट द पेशेंट इज अपने आर टेस्ट पॉजिटिव वी कैन डिक्लेअर ब्रेन डेथ बट इन केसेस if uh, the apnea test has been inconclusive or we were unable to perform we further on move to the ancillary testing so these again as said it's in the cases of uncertainty of diagnosis of brain death or where apnea test could not be performed again we either detect for the cessation of cerebral blood flow in which we either do a cerebral angiography a transcranial doppler ct brain angiography and a mr angiography or a radio nucleotide which is hmpa or isotope scanning if not this then we can also detect for the loss of bioelectrical activity in brain this is done with the somatosensory vogue potentials so this is how a digital subtraction uh, angiography or a dsa is done so basically there is the procedure includes that there is a lack of arterial contrast or opacification where a carotid and ver vertebral arteries enter the skull and therefore correlate with any uh, with absence of perfusion to the cerebrum although in these cases external carotid circulation can appear intact but again this is limited by availability expertise that's needed to perform it the skill cost and transfer from to an or from the icu setup and again limited by the decompressive procedures that may lower the intracranial pressure and they give you a false positive sense of cerebral blood flow being intact then the other is a radio nucleotide imaging that we can perform it's again produced as a signal as a circulate intracranially or pass through a blood brain barrier and are metabolized by metabolically active parenchyma so what we see is a tomographic processing of a lipophilic compounds in it there is an, it is an increasingly used technique as a reference standard although it cannot be done bedside and again shifting from icu to a outside or or a radiology unit is a task then the third commonly done is a transcranial doppler that helps us to assess for the measurement of a dynamic changes in the brain blood flow and helps us to confirm a circulatory arrest when performing anterior or posterior circulation in this systolic spikes and oscillating flow appearance indicate obstruction to blood flow this test although has advantages that it's portable it can be easily performed on the bedside but it's extremely operator dependent 10% patients may do not have in, uh, may do not have adequate windows to perform the test and it again is limited by the decompressive uh, procedures that may lower the intracranial pressure so like this we can also move on if needed to somatosensory evoked potentials or a brain evoked uh, response potential where if we do not find any brain activity in there so now we uh, how do we certify brain death usa asks for only one apnea test and they certify uh, brain death as per it uk on the other hand has uh, asks for two apnea tests wherein they do not define the time of the second testing that needs to be done they imply that uh, they state that the second test can be done any time after we have normalized the blood gas after the first apnea test india uh, again as a guideline asks for two tests before uh, confirming or determining a patient brain dead the second test in india is performed after an interval of 6 hours so when do we say the patient if our tests come out to be positive all of them when do we exactly say as to the time when did the patient die so what's the time of death so as per american academy of neurology guidelines time when pacu2 reaches its target value during the second apnea test that has to be defined as the time of death again some say that after confirmation of post ancillary testing once we have ensured that after the ancillary testing that there is no, no uh, there is no sign of life or brain uh, uh, activity present that's when we declare it as the time of death or in united kingdom when they ask that when your first test confirms the absence of brain stem reflexes that's when we declare it the time of death 
so uh, in apnea testing now because since our intensive uh, care unit management has changed so much and our patients are on a much much more sophisticated life supports to uh, help we discuss very little about brain death and patient on uh, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation so again brain death or death by neurology criteria evaluations in ecmo supported patients have increased uh, in recent years again due to inherent uh, use of the ecmo circuits or as well as by the underlying disease process themselves therefore in brain death or brain death evaluation or uh, is performed similarly in an ecmo patient as in any other patient wherein we check for the brain stem reflexes the apnea test or the ancillary test so again here as well we need to establish that a cause of neurological state complete prerequisites and the same clinical setting is established as in a critically ill patient otherwise apnea testing in ecmo patient is also recommended again here we pre oxygenate using a ecmo gas flows to 100% fio2 with the help of an intubation uh, tube endotracheal tube in it we minimize the sweep gas flow rate that is the co2 clearance rate to 0 to 1 liter per minute so as to prevent any exchange of co2 in the oxygen for membrane oxygenator uh, in patients with va of ecmo or vv ecmo that is the targets of ph and co2 levels are same the recommendation is again the same of ph going less than 7.3 and ph co2 target of more than equal to 60 mm of hg in these patients if for any reason we are unable to perform brain stem reflexes test again we can move on to ancillary testing but with tcd where we measure the pulsatile flow we need to uh, be caution when we are using tcd as an ancillary testing because of the lack of pulsatile flow in patients with ecmo rajiv one minute yes and you move on prachi yes sir okay so now we we'll, uh, discuss uh, how do we define as a pediatric brain death in these patients as well the prerequisites uh, are almost similar that we established an irreversible cause of coma and brain injury but we can consider deferring brain death evaluation for at least 24 to 48 hours after we have resuscitated the patient whenever we are in doubt we in pediatric patient we observe we postpone the brain death evaluation and give optimum time for resuscitation process to take over we here as well we need to exclude any mimicking conditions or confounding conditions metabolic derangements congenital metabolic errors that could be present any issues of neuromuscular blockade agents again need to be addressed drug intoxication again need to be ensured that we have cleared the system of any uh, possible sedative or hypnotic in the drugs the patient needs to be euthermic here the uh, difference is the number of examinations so they have to be two the first examination is to determine the child has met the neurological examination criteria and the second examination is to confirm that the child has fulfilled the criteria for brain death the observation period in it has to be 12 hours if the age of the patient is more than 30 uh, days and has to be 24 hours if age is 37 week estimated gestational age to 30 days uh, here we expect to have two different attending evaluators while assessing for brain stem reflexes we need to keep in mind the primitive reflexes for neonates or infants that may be present at the time of assessing them and uh, uh, for the spinal reflexes as well for the apnea test as well there are two tests that uh, need to be done both tests have to be done by the same attending requires at least 5 to 10 minutes of pre oxygenation again a contraindication is a high cervical spine injury uh in these patients it's recommended uh, a tp sort of self inflating back for oxygenation since because of the 
a catheter in an endotracheal tube uh, or using a CPAP on ventilator can induce barotrauma in these patients. The, uh, the criteria remains the same, that is there is no respiratory effort and the PaCO2 level rises to more than equal to absolute value of 60 or more than equal to 20 rise from the baseline levels. Here as well, we bought the test, if the saturation level goes down below 85% of the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable. Again, the ancillary tests are done in the components, again, uh, of examination or apnea testing cannot be completed safely or they are inconclusive. So lastly, we'll just say that the criteria of brain death determination, as we all know, is a topic of a huge controversy and debate, but a clear approach is required to brain death diagnosis. That is, first of all, we need to ensure that we uh, confer to all the prerequisites that are required before assessing the patient for brain death then we need to use a standardized protocol so as to determine brain death in different health institutions. Proper and precise documentation of the physical examination, apnea test, ancillary testing if done at all to diagnose brain death. A physician who has sufficient expertise should be assessing the patient for it. At every point of time, the family, the patient's family need to be engaged through a proper communication and contact. And unless we are sure of the brain death, nursing care, supportive care should continue unless the, the diagnosis of brain death has been made and confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Prajeep. Uh, 10 minutes over. So you, you get fine for that. Okay, now we move on to the next one. And uh, I did have a couple of things to ask, but I think we'll, 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 we'll just move on and maybe ask you in the panel discussion. So now we move on to the next topic, management of brain death donor. So uh, Prajeep has already certified this guy is brain dead. And, uh, you know, and maybe a possible organ donor. So then it comes to Dr. Seema, how to keep him in a shape so that you can successfully uh, retrieve organs. Uh, Prachi, I wanted to ask you something about ancillary tests. Keep thinking about it. I'll ask you later on. Seema, please. Yeah. Uh... I hope everyone can see the screen. I can. Okay. So, uh, good evening, everybody. I will be talking about management of the cadaveric donor. The success of transplantation in offering patients with end-stage organ disease a chance to live longer and fuller life has increased the need for an expanded pool of organ donors. But sadly, and unfortunately, the wait is very long. This graph clearly depicts, the pink part depicts the patients in the waiting list, and the green part depicts the organs which have been transplanted, the diseased donor donations. So this gap is huge and has increased over a period of years. Even countries like US, which have a very good donor management protocol, an organ allotment protocol in place, the number of patients in waiting list for organs is high. And when we see the data of our own country, we see that the transplants we are doing, the disease donor transplants we are doing, are in just merely thousands, while the patients in waiting lists are more than lakhs. So the issue that exists clearly is a supply and demand problem. With the ongoing organ shortage, a more aggressive pharmacological approach in caring for the brain dead donors may be necessary in order to increase both the number and the quality of the viable organs eligible for transplant. So how does all this work? There is an organ donation process and there is a team of workers which together make it possible. There is a team which is certifying the brain death. There are organ procuring organizations which come into uh, action at that time. There is a team which talks to the family. 
And then very importantly, there's a team which manages this disease donor so that the organ procurement is to the maximum. And I'll be dealing with this part. So before we go to the fact how uh, and what has to be done, we have to know what exactly brain death does to the body, the pathophysiological changes which brain death is causing. It sets into motion a number of responses. There is an initial autonomic storm followed by a late phase and lots of neuroendocrine changes. The critical ischemia and the subsequent infarction of the brainstem is associated with intense autonomic activity. They say the amount of rise in the intracranial pressure is directly proportional to the catecholamine release into the bloodstream. And this massive release of catecholamines will lead to massive rise in blood pressures, heart rates, causing massive systemic vascular resistance to rise, leading to a very high afterload and the central redistribution of blood volume, which adversely affects the myocardial oxygen demand supply ratio. At the same time, it will affect all our organs, which we are planning to transplant. Now, this takes place in a very, uh, in a manner from rostral to caudal, where the ischemia is affecting cerebrum, pons, medulla, and finally the spinal cord. And at each phase, the hemodynamic response we see is very typical. When it affects the pons, you see the Cushing's response. When it goes to the medulla, you will see the autonomic storm and the hypothalamus and the pituitary are affected, causing hormonal dysfunctions. Finally, the ischemia reaches the spinal cord and we see sympathetic deactivation. This is the phase where there is massive vasodilatation, there is massive hypo, hypotension, the heart rate goes down, cardiac output goes down. And again, we have to save the patient here, otherwise the organs will not be procured in a state where they can actually work in the recipient. So the loss of the brainstem function is not only causing loss of vasomotor control, it is causing loss of respiratory function, causing hormonal imbalance, loss of temperature regulation, and cardiac arrhythmias. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenocortical axis is totally impaired. And it is seen that the posterior pituitary is affected more than the anterior. And the most common finding seen in these brain dead patients in around 45 to 80% of cases is the central diabetes insipidus, which if not treated would lead to severe hypovolemia and hypotension and hemodynamic instability in the patient. A sick euthyroid type of state is also seen and there is reduced ACTH and insulin secretions. The lung, which we might think of transplanting or otherwise also we need to maintain because it is oxygenating the organs we need to transplant, suffers a double insult. It suffers an insult because of the hemodynamic changes, the catecholamine strong, where the left-sided pressures in the heart have gone up and which is reflected further into the pulmonary circulation, causing neurogenic pulmonary edema. And the second insult occurs because of the pro-inflammatory agents released from the necrotic brain. This together with other additive factors like hypoxia, pulmonary trauma, aspiration, pneumonitis, gives us a challenge managing the lungs in these patients. Electrolyte and glucose imbalances are seen. This might be a result of events which had led to the hospital admission because of the treatment given prior to the brain death or because of the effect of the brain death also. Glucose imbalance commonly seen in the form of hyperglycemia. This occurs because of insulin deficiency or insulin resistance, gluconeogenesis, the glucose containing fluids we are giving. And these are really going to affect the renal and the pancreatic yield. When we talk about electrolytes, hypernatremia is very common. This is directly associated with the central diabetes insipidus and the sodium containing fluids, which, are, which we are giving to these patients. Hyponatremia, however, is not so common. Very important factor in brain dead patients is hypothermia. The temperature regulating center, which is in the hypothalamus, is uh, there is dysregulation of that. And the patient becomes poikilothermic. He's unable to maintain his own temperature. 
And when the temperature falls down slowly, it will lead to myocardial depression, coagulopathies, the oxygen uh, um, uh, consumption by the tissues will reduce. There will be refractory dysarrhythmias. And all this will affect the organ yield. So it is better avoided than treated. The necrotic brain is seen to create a havoc in the coagulation system also. There is a release of tissue thromboplastin and plasminogen activators by the brain. Moreover, procoagulants are released, like we will have increased fibrin formation, increased platelet activation, hypofibrinolysis. All these might lead to a DIC-like picture in these patients. Now to sum all the pathophysiological changes, we see that almost 80% of these patients will have hypotension. 65% will have a central diabetes insipidus. 30% will have DICs and cardiac arrhythmias. And the rest might have pulmonary edema, acidosis. So management of the donor involves intensively managing each part of it. So what are the goals? The goals is to achieve hemodynamic stability, maintain adequate organ perfusion and oxygenation, improve the function of the transplantable organs, increase the number of organs per donor, and successful organ recovery. And all this has to be done timely. We do not have much time. So let us go to donor assessment and evaluation. In nutshell, it involves early identification of the donor, setting up all the investigations, setting up a monitoring system, resuscitation of the donor, and dealing with the complications of the brain death. The assessment and evaluation involves, this will begin with after the brain death has been certified and the family has authorized. We take a detailed medical history and do a complete physical examination of the patient. Cause and time of declaration of brain death is very important. And a thorough review of the current hospital course will help us know the organ specific function. Infectious disease status, malignancy status, all have to be determined. And the transplant team has to be put into action immediately. Why I say history is important? Because there have been cases reported which show, which have shown transmission of infections like rabies virus, which was given to four transplant recipients. So even a small thing becomes utterly important here. So when we are going ahead with a transplant, when we have a brain dead donor, we have certain things we have to think about. Is this age appropriate? Yes, it was a major factor that we preferred younger donors at a point of time. Now we go for elderly donors also, if other stuff is fine. We have to see that whether the organ which we are considering to transplant has a malignant neoplasm or trauma because of which the patient might have become brain dead or which might be part of the uh, uh, process which has led to the uh, brain death. If he has some transmittable diseases, earlier patients with sepsis were not taken up. Now, if the patient has some amount of sepsis, has been on treatment, is improving, and has been given good broad spectrum antibiotics which are covering the sepsis, they are taken up. Patients with HIV were a taboo. Now HIV donor can give to a HIV recipient. Similarly, HCV infections and all were not taken earlier. Now with good antivirals and methods to know the viral loads, this is no longer a contraindication. Monitoring general, more or less these patients are in the ICU and they have most of the monitoring going on already. But we have to now intensify these monitoring because these, this patient is going to save the life of many more patients. Invasive monitoring, beat to beat, blood pressure monitoring, a CVP line, Foley's catheter, ABGs are must. And special monitors, we have very good monitors which give us dynamic status, like the LITCO, which will give you stroke volume variation, which will help you assess the fluid status of the patient much more efficiently. Serial echocardiographies and a pulmonary artery catheter can also be put in patients where the ejection fractions are low. A battery of investigations are run and they are repeated as and when required, which will cover all the entire organ function, the infection screening and the ABGs. 
Now, each organ is a country in itself and would require a particular way of management. But here we, we are talking of a patient who has all these organs. So we have to take a middle path where we can optimize all the organs in such a way that maximum organ yield can be got. Coming to the management, as I had said earlier, these patients have an initial phase of severe hypertension, but this phase is very transient. But if not treated, it can have a detrimental effect on various organs of the body. So this severe phase of hypertension, we can tackle using short acting agents like beta blockers, like esmolol. We can use uh, nitro, uh, nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, which are short acting because we know that this phase of severe hypertension is followed by a phase of severe hypotension. So we don't want the effects to last very long. Coming to the second phase of hypertension, how do we manage this? This hypertension we know has various causes. This is caused by hypovolemia. This is caused, maybe caused by blood loss, which was occurring in this patient or an ongoing blood loss, which is still occurring. It, may, it is because of central sympatholysis. It is because of hormonal dysregulation. So the primary aim is to maintain hemodynamic stability. And the management would involve, the first step of management would involve having euvolemia in these patients. This is a term which actually uh, one cannot define, but we uh, go for volume resuscitation. We come try to follow certain parameters and resuscitate the patient with fluids first before adding on any other agents. Now, how to decide how much fluid to give, which fluid to give, and how to monitor this patient. So this can be easily done by reviewing the charts. If the patient is on osmotic diuretics, if the central diabetic insipidus has set in, or there is some blood loss coming through various uh, drains put in the patient, then we try to correct this first. Then the patient is assessed as a whole using the clinical parameters, the various waveforms which we are already seeing, monitors like Lipco, Doppler, serial echos, and Fluids are given and the response to the fluid is noted using all these parameters. The choice of fluid can be guided by the cause and the serum sodium levels, the uh, uh, sugar levels in the body and the hemodynamic status. And the aim is to adjust the CVP around six to eight and a urine output of one to two ml per kg per hour. Here, how much volume do we give? If we give too less, we will dry the kidney. And if we give too much, we will wet the lungs. So each transplant surgeon is just looking at their own organ. They might be aiming at a particular CVP and a particular fluid status in their patients. But again, too much of fluid or too less of fluid, we would end up in getting only that particular organ. So a middle path is followed so that maximum organ yield can be obtained. If the patient does not respond to fluid resuscitation, we go to addition of vasopressors. Now, which, again, which vasopressor to add? So a complete review of the vasopressors being used all over the world shows that each uh, country, each region has their own choice. In, in fact, each hospital has its own choice. In Canada, they prefer vasopressin as the first choice of vasopressor. In Germany, it is nor adhering. Earlier, dopamine was the best one because they felt that it increased the renal flow and the kidney yield was better, the graft function was better. But slowly, it has been felt that dopamine is a good drug, but it may lead to a presynaptic modulation of nor release and can affect the heart later on. One can add dobutamine in case the cardiac contractility is affected. So these all vasopressors are used either as first line or in conjunction with each other. And the aim is to maintain hemodynamic stability without using very high doses of any of them. If the patient does not respond to fluid resuscitation, vasopressor addition, a hormonal resuscitation package has been added, which is a must. 
coming to the pulmonary support even if we are looking for a lung as an organ which we are planning to retrieve or we are not we have to maintain a pulmonary function which is good because optimum oxygenation is required to all these organs which have to be transplanted for this a lung protective ventilation is the best technique where you use tidal volumes which are not very high around 6 to 8 ml per kg peep of 5 to 10 low maximum plateau pressures and fio2s just enough to maintain the saturation around 95% normal capnias and repeated recruitment of the lungs strict asepsis with broad spectrum antibiotics and abgs as and when required now coming to the endocrine support in these patients as i earlier mentioned that central diabetes insipidus is common in these patients 65% of these patients suffer from central diabetes insipidus and this can lead to maximum hemodynamic instability by causing lot of fluid loss from the body this is defined as urine output more than 4 ml per kg per hour with a rising serum sodium more than 145 increased serum osmolarity greater than 300 milliosmoles per liter and a decreased urine osmolarity less than 200 now these are figures once in a brain dead patient we do not have to wait for these results to come if we see that a brain dead patient is having a very high urine output and other causes of diuresis are omitted like he is not on any osmotic diuresis he is not having very severe hyperglycemia then it is better to institute the therapy for diabetes insipidus immediately so what is the therapy the therapy is first is volume replacement the amount of volume which is being lost we have to replace to have hemodynamic stability we have to prevent the sodiums to reach a very high levels so we prefer fluids which do not have sodium we like we will have half normal saline or we can take 5% dextrose keeping in mind that too much of 5% dextrose can lead to hyperglycemia so becoming prepared with that, those consequences at the same time at the same time the main drug which is going to act on central diabetes insipidus is vasopressin if the patient is hemodynamically stable it is better to start with desmopressin if hemodynamic instability has set in it is better to give iv vasopressin so uh the difference between desmopressin and vasopressin is that desmopressin is very selective it will act on v2 receptors and it will have its antidiuretic action it is more powerful longer duration of action and it is available in parenteral form you have nasal sprays you have iv form you can give it easily when we come to vasopressin it has its own advantage once the patient is hemodynamically unstable then this will not only have its antidiuretic effect it will have its vasopressor effect also so in these patients we would press prefer vasopressin coming to the next uh, thyroid uh, endocrine um, organ next is thyroid initially it was felt that uh, supplementation of thyroid hormones was must and it has been part of the unos pro uh, protocol for many many years now these patients have sick euthyroid syndrome and a recent study by dhal et al has shown that um, he uh, saw a lot of uh, retrospect rcts and lot of observational studies and he found that there was a marginal improvement in uh, the uh, hemodynamic status in the uh, hearts for transplant after giving uh, thyroid hormone uh, it decreased the inotropic requirement but at the same time he said that normally this hormone is given in a package along with the other three hormones of the hormonal package so how much contribution the thyroid hormone has we cannot say so uh, going by this the um, uh, the canadian organ procurement guidelines do not uh, uh, they are against giving thyroid hormones as a protocol 
for any brain dead donor. Uh, we still go by it. And uh, these IV preparations are available. If they are not available, tablet thyroxine can be also given to the nasogastric tubes. Most important is cortisol replacement. Now this acts in two ways. It not only improves the hemodynamics by its vasopressor effect, but it also reduces inflammation. It attenuates the effect of pro-inflammatory cytokinins, which are released as a consequence of brain death. And therefore, it will improve the donor organ function and graft survival. It will increase, increase the tissue oxygenation, donor lung recovery, and it is recommended by the UNOS. Immediately, once the patient is diagnosed as brain dead, we give methylprednisolone in the dose of 15 milligrams per kg, and this can be repeated after 24 hours. So the current guideline starts uh, which stand for the standard hormonal resuscitation package is methylprednisolone. Uh, you can give T3 or T4 and vasopressin. Along with it, maintenance of uh, normal glucose levels or gluc glucose level in the range of 120 to 180 is our aim. For this, an insulin infusion can be started because hyperglycemia can actually affect graft functions in kidney and pancreas. Saying that the other basic management of an ICU patient continues, that is the nutrition. Whatever uh, nutritional management of the patient was being taken should be continued. Hematological support should be given in the form that if the uh, hemoglobin is very less, hematocrit is less than 30%, you can go for a um, transfusion. But uh, INRs of less than 1.5 and platelet counts more than 50,000 are acceptable. The electrolytes aim should be to prevent this electrolytemia by supplementing them. Hypothermia, as I said, leads to a lot of complications, arrhythmias, coagulopathies, decreased oxygen um, delivery. So this has to be actively tackled. And how do we tackle it? By using warming blankets, warm fluids, humidified gases, and the ambient temperature can also be uh, you know, managed accordingly. So uh, there was a very good article which said, uh, again from uh, the Canadian guidelines, which said that um, normally we, uh, our aim is to maintain the temperatures more than 35. But this article said that if you want to procure good uh, quality kidney grafts, then a temperature of 34, between 34 to 35 is good, is, is the best. And they have found in their studies that the patients who were maintained at this temperature required less dialysis, their creatinine levels were less. So this is a, a new thing which has uh, come up again recently. Uh, now talking about hypernatremia, which is so commonly found along with diabetes insipidus, this affects our liver graft and it has to be uh, tackled with adequate fluid choices. In a nutshell, to sum up, we go by rules of 100, where we maintain the systolic blood pressure around 100, heart rate 100, urine output 100 ml per hour, PACO2 at 100, RBS of 100 and hemoglobin around 10. This was given uh, years and years ago, and it still holds good. If we can maintain our donor at this level, we will have maximum organ yield. Intraoperatively, once we take the donor to the OT, same principles as in ICU setting, we assure hemodynamic stability, give good diuresis and adequate muscle relaxation because sometimes spinal reflexes can cause awkward movements and uh, can affect the surgery. So the big wins in the donor management is a prior planning and donor protocol. Continued excellence in ICU care, early use of methylprednisolone, early use of vasopressin for vasoplagia and diabetes insipidus, early use of flow monitoring. We need dynamic monitors. We do not use, we do not need static monitors. They are very precious patients for us. So when available, we should go for uh, dynamic monitoring. Standardization of care and audit. A critical care pathway for organ donors was published and a lot of other studies which have shown 
that uh, many of the countries have chopped out their donor management protocols. The critical pathway for organ donor, which is so very uh, famous, used by the UNOS. These protocols will guide various peripheral centers as to what to investigate, when to intervene, and such protocols are the mainstay of the um, success of a transplant program. The survival of a transplanted organ depends heavily on pre-donor and donor management implementations. And to end it without the organ donor, there is no story, no hope, no transplant. But when there is an organ donor, life springs from death, sorrow turns to hope, and a terrible loss becomes a gift. And we can actually contribute a lot to it by managing our donor properly. Thank you. Thank you, Seema. That was wonderful. Uh, I wish we could go on and on, but time is limited. I like that the formula of 100, keep it simple, 100 blood pressure, 100 pulse, 100 urine. Great. But I think we've got to move on. And I really want to hear our friend, uh, Dr. Harshad Jori, and he's going to talk about law and the legal issues. So we'll, we'll have a panel discussion. I, I hope we have time for that. So we move on now to Harsh's talk on law and the legal issues in organ donation. Thank you. Dr. Jauri, we all know, uh, he's the organ transplant surgeon in uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, probably someone who's done more renal transplant than anywhere else in India. He was right there when we all started doing organ transplants. Yes, uh, sir, all yours. Thank you, for, thank you for those kind words, Vijay. And thank you, the Indian College of Anesthetists, for inviting me. And I know that time is very precious, so I will condense the talk. A lot of it has already been covered by Prachi and Seema. So basically, it's an introduction to organ transplant and national organ transplant program and the transplant law. So what do you need to know about this? Everything. There is no shortcut. Anybody involved in transplantation must know about this act. There is no getting away from it. And what is important is, as Seema has pointed out, why the need for the act? There was a huge gap between demand and supply and there was a lot of organ bazaar going on. And we also had to increase the awareness and positive attitude towards diseased organ donation if we had to catch up. And we had to organize a system where you could uh, you know, have procurement for the tissues and the organs and distribution. So for that, an act was created in 1994, and that was largely based and focused on the donor. Who are you? Where are you from? How much have you been paid? Have you not been paid? If you are the mother, prove that you are the mother. So it did not work because there were some inherent problems in it, and it was felt that the requirement is recipient-based. So. It was in 2004 that uh, the Delhi High Court created a committee out of which I was one of the members in which the act was amended. However, the original act had sneaked in something called the brain stem death. Now, I would like to clarify to every one of you, everyone is using the word brain death interchangeably with brain stem death. In India, we talk about brain stem death as far as the act is concerned. The law is concerned, the testing is concerned, we are talking about brain stem death and not brain death. Even the certification is brain stem death because this is all to do with organ donation. And if you want to make it more and more acceptable, we definitely have to widen the acceptability of this. Now, the important thing in this was that, uh, where are we, hello? So the Transplantation of Human Organs Act, the purpose, as I said, was regulation and removal and storage and transportation and transplantation of Human Organs Act for therapeutic purposes. That is the important thing. Now, 
When we say therapeutic purposes, we cannot use it for anything else, which is where the problem arises. Because in India, people want to donate their entire bodies. And they say, take what you want in terms of organs and uh, use the rest for scientific research. Now, that is covered by the Anatomies Act, which there are a number of them. The one which is most commonly used is the Delhi Act and, uh, and Bombay, where the entire body is taken for scientific research and teaching, where timing is not of importance. Whereas here, we are talking about taking the organs and the body is not of concern to us. So therefore, timing is of importance. So this is something which we are aiming to bring together into some kind of legislation. Now, that is where we are regarding the Anatomy Act. The other part of it is, uh, now we come to the, what is the highlight of the act? Somebody mentioned just now in the beginning that where is there is a definition of brainstem death? The definition is very clear. The brainstem death means the stage at which all functions of the brainstem have permanently and irreversibly ceased and is so certified. And also, deceased person means a person in whom permanent disappearance of all evidence of life occurs by reason of brainstem death or in a cardiopulmonary sense at any time after life birth has taken place. Now we are trying to bring the two together into a uniform declaration of death. When you say a person has died because of X, Y, Z in a brainstem or cardiopulmonary sense, the records thereof will be kept in the hospital, but you do not have to have these two different kinds of death a death certificate where one is a one page one signed by a house officer and is valid and the other one you have got four doctors giving a certificate examined twice over and the person at the burial ground or at the registration of certificate they don't know what you are talking about the bank does not honor it so we are trying to bring it into one so that there's a wider acceptability and those that wish to give organs will give the organs but otherwise uh, so that is the important part of that now, we have amendment to the Act came into the force in 2011, where we brought in tissues as well. Now, some of the other important things of this was tissues were included. Uh, the scope was expanded. Near relatives were expanded from father, mother, brother, sister, uh, siblings, children to grandparents and grandchildren, which basically is a nonsense because anybody is that young or that old normally will not be recipients, nor will they be donors. But the idea was to bring it in, to widen the scope. Registration of non-transplant retrieval centers and tissue banks. For example, in Delhi, you have got about 30 centers doing transplant, but you've got at least 350 centers perfectly capable of giving you donors. So we are talking about creating a non-transplant retrieval centers. And if somebody has a brainstem death patient, you can give their provisions now, you can give them a 24 hours, within 24 hours, you claim a uh, NTORC center certificate. So you can go and take the organs from there. Then there has got to be an inquiry that's called required request. We are all very emotional people. You ask anybody for dead body and they start beating you up and breaking up the ICU. So this was the required request that the doctor on duty is required by law to ask. You're free to say yes or no, but basically you have to ask. <clears throat> then you have to have a mandatory transplant coordinator in hospitals. And we also got the swap donors. That is the exchange between, but what was not mandated is the uh, domino kind, which people are trying to bring in that you have six sets or eight sets and, you know, zigzagging down the line. That is not permitted. You can only have near relatives and the <coughs> who are giving to each other's near donors. So to, from the, the near recipients. So where are we? Hello. I've got lost. No, I haven't. Swipe down. Okay. Where are we? Now, the brain death certification committee was simplified. National Human Organs and Tissue Removal 
we have created Noto, Roto, and Soto. Uh, the central one in Delhi. <coughs> you have got a national registry has come up. You've got advisory committees. You got a nucleation of corneas by trained technicians. Earlier, only the doctors used to go. A lot of corneas were lost. So trained technicians who have done a minimum of so many uh, nucleations under training, they can go and get. Then there are higher penalties for commercial dealing. They'll come to that. Greater caution is for removal is not permitted from living mentally challenged people. It's not permitted. And Indian donors cannot donate to foreigners. That means Indian kidneys will not cross our shores unless they are near relatives. Now, the content of the act has got, uh, you know, you've got certain chapters, preliminary authority for removal. I'm not going to all of them, regulation of hospitals. But what is important is, <clears throat> this is the name of the act, Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues Act, called HOTA. And uh, authority for removal. Now, this is another problem. You can in an ICU have somebody put his thumb on a piece of paper saying this dog, this property of mine can go to somebody else and it's valid. But a donor pledge is more of an intent and it is not legally binding on the family to accept, which is why we say that the family should be brought in to the views of the donor, potential donor in a non-crisis situation. So that God forbid, if the time comes, the family can at least say, my father or my mother wanted X, Y, or Z in his lifetime. So let's do this rather than imposing their own views. Sorry. So if any donor in his writing and in the presence of two witnesses unequivocally authorized any time before his death. So this is a donor pledge. We've got a form seven for that, a detailed one. And donation after death, even if you've got no such authority, the person lawfully in possession, initially the family, immediate family, emotionally tied, or the official in possession of the body can uh, permit that. Regulation of hospitals, very clear. Transplant activity has to be done under government supervision, whether it's a private or a non-government institution or a government institution. Any transplant done <clears throat> in a non-registered hospital is illegal. Any practitioner who does not fulfill the requirements of a transplant uh, the healthcare worker is illegal. So a donor has no existence by himself. He has to be linked to a particular uh, recipient in the case of living donation. And <clears throat> sorry, even uh, the cadaver one has to be linked the so and so person has given the office and who they are going to. So, who means which uh, center they are going to? So, everyone is being tracked. Regulation of hospitals again, same thing with tissues. We are a bit far away from tissues at the moment. Now, appropriate authorities have been created by the government to regulate hospitals involved in the transplantation and to prevent commercialization, two authorities were formed. One is the authorization committee, which is by the state government, which give the permission and the appropriate authority, which is normally the director general health uh, of the state. And uh, the powers thereof of the authorization is, it establishes that the unrelated donors are not under any coercion or unduly influenced by monetary consideration, no emotional blackmail, approves the transplant between other than near related donors and recipients in case of foreign national approval from the AC is required over the NOC from the respective country and seeks verification from the respective states. <coughs> Appropriate authority, again, the government has created these uh, in each state, in the center, it is the Director General Health Services. Now, the powers are very really, uh, clear to grant registration, to renew registration, to suspend or cancel registration in case of violation, to investigate any complaint or breach, to inspect hospitals periodically for examination of quality of transplantation, 
and follow up medical care. And then it has the powers of a civil court to summon you to court. Then you have got punishment for violation. Earlier it was five years, gone up to 10 years if you're doing an uh, uh, illegal transplant and the fine has gone up from 10 lakh, uh, 10,000 to five lakhs. And if you are doing any commercial activity, the imprisonment goes from two to seven years to five to 10 and from 10,000, 20,000 to 20 lakhs to one crore. So it is really not worth for any doctor, for any institution to involve themselves in anything of this kind. Now, this is the National Organ Retrieval Banking. This is what has been mandated. So for this, what was created is a National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization where the head, the head office is at uh, Sadarjan. That's called NOTO. And then you have got six regional uh, centers called ROTOs. And then you've got each state has got a state. Uh, so the ROTO was idea is to combine strong transplant uh, centers and states along with some not so strong. For example, there are parts of the country where there's virtually no transplant activity. And there are parts now where there is a lot of south, down south. Most of them are doing quite well. Uh, in the western part of the country, there's a lot of it. East. There was virtually no work going on. Odisha, Bengal was not doing much. Northeast was not doing. Chhattisgarh was not doing. Bihar was not doing. So we are trying to bring as many of them as possible, right? Uh, establishment of a nationwide network to include all transplant centers, all retrieval organizations, and then future all trauma centers, all dialysis centers. The government has tried to bring in that every district hospital will have dialysis. And it was the objective that all medical colleges should have transplant activity. So all hospitals with ICUs, this is the idea is to have a nationwide network. It is easier said than done, but it doesn't work out quite so simply, but we are trying. Then the national registry is mandated. You are supposed to maintain waiting lists. You're supposed to, of the various organs, you're supposed to have different lists for different organs. You have to, facilitate matching of organs through a computerized da database, but then it requires that there is information given to the center, uh, even at the local level. So there's a single uh, database and it reflects. But again, we have some anomalies, for example, Gurgaon and Delhi is side by side. But if you go strictly by state, then an organ from Gurgaon will have to go to, shall we say, Rivadi, but from or from uh, you know East Delhi, it will have to go to West Delhi, but from Noida, it will have to, to go to Kanpur or Lucknow, but not into Delhi. So you know we have to work those things out. So this is where you have created a NOTO. And I will not go ahead. Basically, the NOTO is for creating the organ donation. ROTO is for allocation, and the actual transplantation is at uh, the sort of levels, which is controlling the state. However, allocation is a big bugbear. You have to bear in mind, who do you give the organ to? You have got one kidney. Do you give it to the breadwinner? Do you give it to an elder person who has got responsibilities? Do you give it to a young person who has got life ahead of him? Do you give it to a young lady whose husband has died and has got three children? I mean, what do you do? Who, do you give it to a rich person who has got a thousand people working and they depend on him? Do you give it to a poor person? So allocation is the biggest bugbear in a country like India where acute shortage of organs exist. <clears throat> the types of donors, as per the Thota, we all know, is deceased donor, live donor, live related, live unrelated. And so we are fully aware of that. Uh, okay, where are we? So we have got the various forms. They are... Uh, one second, we go back here. Come on, I'm the closest thing to a techno brain dead person you can find. Now, this is 22 uh, uh, forms we have got for various kinds of activities in transplantation, but the one which we are interested in is form seven, which is for organ pledging so that you have a card with you. And now people are trying to bring it into the driving licenses and into your uh, various. 
you know, Aadhaar cards, wherever you can put it. But the idea is you can't put it into a very permanent kind of document because you are allowed to change your mind. So if you change your mind, uh, what happens to the do document? If you once said, I want to give my kidneys, the tomorrow you say, I don't want to give. So then the driving license becomes invalid. So, you know, there are problems with that, but people are bringing it in. So that's good for them. Uh, again, for tissue pledging. Again, for tissue pledging. Now, this is the one. This is the one you people are interested in mainly, certification of brainstem death. Now, physical examination and apnea test. Uh, while it is a very good scientific exercise that we follow all the world and we talk about ancillary tests, etc., etc., a lot of people, including Dr. Vijay Vora, sat down when the earlier parts were there and we went through and decided that ancillary tests should not be included in the law or in the rules. Because if you have some centers which are doing it and some which are not doing it, then you are opening yourself up to lawsuits and all kinds of problems that the guy was dead, not dead, whatever it was. So ancillary tests, by and large, you can do it as an exercise, but it's legally not required. And if you think it is supporting your diagnosis, uh, it actually is laying you open to a lawsuit. So, you know, there's a lot of problems here. So we should go by the law when we are certifying and we do not talk about ancillary tests uh, till such time as the law is changed, which may take donkey's years. Having said that, having said that, in a country like India, which is so vast, it is better not to certify somebody brain dead if you are not satisfied. But if you are, then uh, if you're going to certify, then do it on the basis of what the law says. And the second part of it is, once we have certified brainstem death, uh, even if there's no organ donation, we want to bring in the fact that we can switch off the plug, uh, which really the law still does not deny, it does not say you can't do, but there is no positive affirmation. If somebody has cardiac death, you can immediately stop the oxygen, take out the ECG, take out the catheters, tubes, drains, everybody, nobody questions you. But the moment you have brainstem death, and you start taking out anything in India immediately, they'll say the cheeks are pink and the fellow's producing urine, he's got some electrical activity. So it is a it is a challenge. So legally you are not banned, but practically everybody will stop you. So then you wait for actually cardiac death. So it becomes very difficult. Application for approval of transplant, that's a different affair, which you don't really want. Uh, challenges ahead. Now, these are three things, basically, which I'll just take two minutes on and then we'll call it off. One is the Certificate of Uniform Declaration of Death, which will go a long way in making people aware that there are two different ways in which or modes in which you can die. One where your heart and your lung stops and the other one where your brain stops. So, without it being linked to transplantation. That is the larger way of doing it. It will take time, but it will happen. And once the banks... Uh, and the you know burial guards and the cremation grounds and all that begin to accept it, then life becomes easier. And the documentation obviously will be kept in the hospitals. The other one is the merging of the THOTA and the Anatomy Act, so that if somebody says, I want to give my kidney, and you, I want to give my body, and you take whatever organs you like and the rest, so we have to do that. The other one is the donor after brain death and donor after cardiac death, there is absolutely no bar in the country, in the law, you can do it both ways, but there are many people who want to have a more positive affirmation that uh, donation after cardiac death can be done. So if that is so, uh, we are going to wait for that, but then laws don't change so easily. If you want to change even a comma, it has to go right back to parliament and it's not an easy affair. I know that it took me almost 11 years to uh, modify the act along with a few others. Again, clarification is required and role of ancillary tests. There's more pressure from the anesthetists who want it or the uh, intensivists. But if you bring it in as uh, possibly as something which people can do, but not must do, then we are going to face a lot of problems with that. 
and so therefore you can save a life and thank you for that and uh, yeah so thank you and there are lots of questions which can rise in this I'll, I'll try to answer them if you can ask me and if we have the time so thank you very much back to you Vijay thank you thank you Harsh that that was wonderful uh, you guys have already opened up you know the discussion <laughs> discussion points here about you it's all come in this whatever I I had for the panel discussion can I share my screen please now? do please do yeah hello I am yeah can you hear me yes we can okay Thank okay. You. Okay. Now, now, now we move on to the next bit. No. I think this is uh, Archana. Are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir. But, you know, why? You know, we want to identify why the donation rate is uh, so poor, and what do we need to do? I know you guys are doing a lot, but uh, is it the medical profession you think, uh, or is it public at large? You see, you look at this next slide. This is from China. They said it's the doctors who are lacking uh, in the effort. So, where do you, what, what do you say? You know, you guys get approached from all sides. Where mm -hmm. do you think is uh, really? I know it has to be done at all levels, but where do you think is the doctors probably more? You know. Be clear. Don't, 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 don't hesitate saying anything here. Thank you so much, sir, for giving me the privilege. Yeah. I believe it's the both way. Uh, but yes, DSD declaration is the one bottleneck which we are experiencing right now. So I think it should be more common in the hospital as a practice. So we can have more donation. Behavioral change and uh, community awareness is definitely one part. But uh, if we start asking and if we start, our intensities start declaring train, uh, train train, driver or dedicate kar do jab wo bache yahan pe aaye so do you think that kind of somebody needs to unmute yeah carry on that sir yeah so my point of view sir if the bsd declaration will be Become more common among our medical professionals. Yeah. Uh, the donation will increase. I think you guys did a very took a very good initiative and in having you know uh, what you call programs for the intensivists. I really feel you know that is where the organs are being are going to be generated and they have to be sensitized and you know we need to work on that. Okay, uh, I think I'll leave that. Uh, now, already talked about two sets of death uh, tests done. Family withdraws the consent. Can we declare a person dead and withdraw the life support? Harsh already brought it up, and I want Richa's view on that. Richa, where are we on that? Richa, Hello? Yes. You, yeah. Yes. Um, I'm really sorry. I was uh, I got disconnected in between. So what I understand is the issue being that if the family withdraws the consent, yeah. um, so the you con have declared him brain dead. So right. You, you told him this guy is dead, and now he withdraws. And if I ventilate him, you are going to catch my neck. Why are you ventilating him? So can't, should we not uh, withdraw the life support? So when you're talking about the consent, just for my clarity, whose consent are we talking about here? The patient's uh, advanced consent or we are talking about the family's consent? Family, family, family. You see, brain dead. Family has given consent. Go ahead, take the organs. Because we had done the brain stem death criteria. We said, we are certifying him, he is dead. And then see, some uncle comes in, he says, no, 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 or whatever. They withdraw. Now... You are one side, you said he's dead. We are going to take organ, and now you want to ventilate. What is it? So, um, as far as the legal position is concerned, there is no set law on that. There are only case laws which support the situation. 
um if the patient had given an consent that was a completely different uh, scenario but if there is no advance consent even given by the patient and uh, the patient has gone into the situation without any directives about that then in that scenario also there is a very recent judgment of uh, 2018 which basically says that in that situation the treating team can inform the hospital and then hospital can set up a medical board the medical board can uh, ascertain the situation examine it or three experts in the medical board can ascertain and examine and if that certifies that the patient is brain dead the situation is ir ir um, uh, is is uh, incurable and basically all you will be doing is prolonging his death in that situation the hospital can basically then approach uh, the appropriate authorities for the purposes of um, the appropriate authority being the first class judicial magistrate oh. uh, to declare that um, to uh, requesting them to set up a medical board and once that medical board also um, assesses the patient and confirms comes to a conclusion that the patient is of that situation then the uh, the first class judicial magistrate can give instructions to withdraw the support so, so that is the very recent judgment which is the case law now on the subject matter okay so you don't believe the guys four doctors big doctors who had certified you still want to go to the law i agree i mean i am i take your point you see, but that is the legal situation i would never recommend a doctor to take things in his own hand and say that okay uh, yeah. there is only one level of assessment which says that it's brain dead and we go ahead with that the law has already prescribed for this process so that process has to be followed oh you lawyers uh, noto noto does it, does it say anything archana Achna, any 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 uh, guideline from Noto on, on this kind of oh, thing? Sir. No, nothing. Okay, I'll tell you. This is the Kerala government which came out with a notification in on January 19, 2020. And what does it say? All treatments, including cardiopulmonary support, must be discontinued once brain stem death is pronounced. so kerala has taken the lead taken off life support uh, for which even family consent is not required this is legal document uh, uh, richa i am telling you and this has happened in kerala not in delhi and cr kerala this has happened uh, but dr vora the, the the only difference being that the supreme court judgment is going to prevail over a state prolongation here so my my issue here is that the doctor should not be taken to the court for something that is done in the interest of the patient yeah. and to save that scenario if a process has been set up we don't want a scenario where a doctor is taking an action or doing a uh, you know action or an action in the interest of the patient in the interest of maybe somebody who is going to receive an organ but tomorrow ends up being behind the bar or ends up being um, uh, you know uh, the allegations of um, you know that's due to negligence or something like that so that's the only scenario which we are trying to tackle i know uh, richa you are you are working for for us uh, i know harsh wants to say something but uh, all i am saying is the law has been passed in kerala so mm -hmm. you can't quote that law and do it here in uh, tell tell us to okay go ahead and do it i wouldn't I know, I know you don't want to stick your neck out. Yes, Harsh, you want to say something. There are two aspects to it. One is that the law is very clear. You are dead or you are not dead. Yes. Yeah. If you are dead, you can't be dead. Dead, waiting for some other kind of death. So once you have been certified dead by a person who was an intern yesterday, and today he has got his registration, he says you have stopped breathing, your heart has stopped, so you are dead. You might wake up one hour later, but you are dead. right and because i'm pulling out all the tubes because this has got the history of tradition behind you people accept it now unfortunately organ donation because of brain uh, stem death is recent people have not got come used to the idea and there is a certain amount of distrust but the fact still remains once you have declared it by due process of law where a parliament has passed a particular act defining how a person is dead then actually it is a matter of education a matter of making the brain stem you know the death certification more widely used and i think you know bodies like the ima and the various other things 
should declare that people should not be penalized like the judgment you have given from the court. Issues like that. Only then on a particular... Otherwise, this is defensive medicine. We basically say in government hospitals or non-government, isko ghar le jao. You don't say it openly that the guy is dead. Yeah. I agree with so, you. I totally agree with you. Defensive. We have to move it's on. more defensive. But the legal on. position is he's dead. You should be able to withdraw all support systems. But because we are emotional, we are all scared. Think people start beating up everybody, breaking up the joint. So people don't do anything. And I don't think any country actually has got a positive affirmation that you start removing organs. I don't think anybody's got that kind of courage. Nobody does it. Right. Uh, so, yes, the yes, only, it, yeah. yes. So the only thing I'm saying, the law is there. The, the law has come to the books now, but there is a process defined. Sure. So all the request is that the process should be followed. Nobody is saying, a you know, a brain dead is not dead. If it's certified brain dead, it is incurable. It is only prolonging the inevitable, then yes it is somebody who is eligible for that kind of a withdrawing of support, but a process needs to be followed. Law is about following that process. Judiciary is on top. Okay, agreed. Now let's move to the next issue. We don't have that much time. Uh, recipient, donor, family, you got the organ now. Okay. Now they want to know who the donor is. Should we tell them? Should we tell them the age of the donor? And should we tell them what the donor was suffering from? reasons of brain death why did he die you know they want to have a lot of questions you know uh who wants to i seema do you want to uh, take that are you there what can you tell the donor family sorry recipient family they want to know about the donor you know they want a maybe good quality organ i mean let's put it that way so how much can you tell uh, sir, I, I, I don't have much uh, knowledge about the legal issues, yeah. but uh, definitely uh, the stuff like the age of the donor, what yeah. he's suffering from, the reason of brain death, it yeah. should not affect a family who's been waiting, uh, the person has end stage disease and who's, uh, you know, uh, on the transplant list and uh, may not get an organ in the yeah. near uh, future. So, yes, and yes. some things like age, we have transplants of uh, people 90 to 95 years old also, and people have taken the organs. And mm -hmm. regarding the HCV infections, HPV infections with uh, good antiviral agents available, it is the way we put it to the patient's family, I think, which matters. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think Sima is right there. Maybe, you know, age, if it is an extreme of age, maybe you need to tell them, you know, you can't say that you're going, getting 90 year, year um, uh, and, uh, you know, donor. So maybe extremes you can tell. And yeah. Informed consent is essential, I feel. Yeah. I, okay. yeah. okay. Now there is a, okay, I think we've gone through that. Now, can they have a say who gets the organ? You know, I'll tell you, there was a story that, you know, they said, okay, look, my Somebody is brain dead. Now they want to. They are saying that one of my relative is suffering from kidney failure. Please give kidney to him, and uh, you know rest of the things. Whatever you want to do, can this be done? Uh, noto first. I think uh, uh, Archana will 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 tell us. Is there any directive from Noto? Sir, I have already said no. Directive uh, donation is not there, so we okay. cannot do that. See, it lays open a whole lot of problems. Uh, people have done it, but it is not correct. Yeah, Better this, not to have the donation, but then not to go in that direction. Richa, because, it, yeah, Richa, is there anything on that? I don't think a law has anything on that. Is there? Okay, another thing we already talked about, time of death on the certificate. These are different ones. Uh, Let's not spend too much time on it. Do we still go on the flat line or brain stem deaths? Number two. Testing testing of the second time. Seema? Testing of the second time. I agree. Everybody agrees on that. There's no other way. Prachi, Prachi, where are you? Yes, are you sir. What, what, what is it? 
because you see when we are doing the retrieving organs the message comes from outside you know they want to know when did you when the icg went flat so time of death i i think uh, i mean we will definitely give the time of death as when the second apnea test uh, came out to be positive because that is when we put a stamp on it that uh, and we uh, confirm it that the patient is uh, effectively brain dead but yes family do insist on knowing probably for them ethically or some for reasons for them they want to know as to when did it come as a flat line and when did the heart actually stop beating on table so that is a time that we i mean uh, as a ot anesthetist we note down because the families do question about it so uh, otherwise uh, legally we document the second apnea time as as okay. the time of death okay now you know harsh had brought this up you know this guy had said you know the family said you can have the whole body you can have the organs who gets priority harsh you have to answer that okay now the thing the point is we want organs in pristine condition yeah. so therefore time is of the essence yeah. which is why even for medical legal cases you are yeah. trying to do the transplant or donation at night yeah whereas when you're giving for body donation for research Yeah. The anatomy department will not accept any body which has been tampered or any part of the organs have been removed. They will not accept it. So you have to have one or the other. That's what I'm saying. But Order we have to try to. Body. But we try to bring it together if possible, because this is the need. This is the demand okay. of the patients yeah. that you know we want to do both. So what do you do? You say, "Ham to organ le lenge, baaki tum jano." Or who says, "Ham body de denge, hamko organs se matlab nahi." So, so we have to try to bring it together. It's a need, so yeah. we have to bring it so together. So we don't have an answer as yet. Okay. No. No. Right. Okay. Can the brain dead declared in, let's say, Gangaram Hospital? Can they be moved to Medanta, uh, uh, Archana? Definitely not to Medanta, but definitely not in law. You can't. There's no provision for shifting dead bodies and admitting them. Chalo. Harsh is very clear. I think we have, everybody agrees on that. there is no provision for admitting dead bodies yeah okay i think he knows the law very well kamai danta to bilkul nahi bhejenge can the time interval be reduced noto is there anything look the patient is deteriorating you know his pressure is going down is there any provision in the law can okay can we do it after 4 hours is so there any more provision No that. provision, not no. as of now. Okay, I think we all agree on that. Uh, I think let's let's skip that. Can we get paid model into our our organ donation because we want to increase? Uh, is there anything work? Any noto doing anything on that? Look, I mean you know you need organs. If if it is comes through the noto, everybody pays noto. and then it goes to the donor family how what is wrong with that nothing wrong the only thing that works in this is kidney transplants and all cadaveric work comes to a halt okay so no no for that no money okay let's let's move to this is this is another interesting area donation after cardiac death is it relevant in indian setup is it legal or not uh archana is it legal it is legal and it is relevant but very less practice presently only pgi is doing it so we need to have more people exist for the even this and then doing it i think i'll i'll leave this one also uh so what i what i what i was trying to get at is uh are we uh, where is richa gone Richa, are you there? Richa, can you unmute? Hello. हाँ जी, can you hear me? हाँ, I'm so sorry. This हाँ. is so. This yes. is you know in uh, when you are doing like you say it is there is a provision of uh, donation after circulatory death. Now yes. what happens in donation after circulatory death is. 
you have to disconnect the ventilator because other if you don't if you just withdraw support it will take a very long time the blood pressure goes down slowly oxygenation goes down slowly so really you have to disconnect where do we stand on passive euthanasia and active this becomes active euthanasia so are we are we there in the law or will you still say take order from the your high no court? no i will not say that the law is very 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 clear passive yeah. euthanasia is something which has been acknowledged accepted by law accepted yeah. by the supreme court and there is a process laid down for the purposes of implementing the passive euthanasia whether it is with the consent whether it is without the consent when we say with consent it means advanced directive without consent when the patient reaches that situation but active euthanasia is still not accepted as a acceptable approach by the indian courts even outside india i really doubt if there are uh, any jurisdictions where active euthanasia is accepted so i think worldwide i would say that active euthanasia is not an acceptable modality now i am telling you wherever they are doing donation after circulatory death passive would be you are not providing active support yes if the patient is on ventilator you let the ventilator continue drugs are withdrawn he will he or she will take hours i don't know for it will take a long time to have a circulatory that you know flat line over there whereas the practice where they are actively practicing donation after circulatory death they ask the relatives to meet the somebody who is a, you know whose uh, support is going to be withdrawn then they wait for the flat line for 5 minutes and then they start the process of retrieval of organ if you don't do that if you practice your passive euthanasia means withdraw the services still continue ventilation withdraw vasopressor withdraw medication you actually will not be able to have donation after circulatory death the organs will be gone organs will slowly become ischemic so here i would like food. to clarify i think there yeah. is a disconnect in the definitions which we have yeah. uh, under law active euthanasia is basically where you are um, um where you are facilitating somebody's death by actually maybe injecting a, a, a chemical or maybe actively ending the life of a person but when you're talking about passive euthanasia under law currently the situation is that even withdrawing of life support is passive euthanasia where you have proved through those medical boards that the patient has reached a certain stage so yeah. withdrawal of ventilation withdrawal of supporting uh, uh, mechanism is considered as passive euthanasia not active euthanasia so next time if we do that you are going to support us uh, in the court once you, when you get me two medical board opinions and we go to oh the oh my god you are good i will which, i will do that <laughs> okay so she says it's possible we can you the see the process see uh, i mean are you guys are all learned doctors and you i mean i i i i don't have that much of clinical background but law is all about process you follow the process and there are protections you do not follow the process the protection falls away no no i i'm simply asking you know withdrawing the ventilator is it passive or active it is passive provided you're following the process what is the process go to the court the process is you go to the court oh uh, no that is not the no. process that is process that we don't want Okay. Exactly, that's what it is. <laughs> By the time you get the court to listen, you'll have a flat line. Yeah, I understand. Right. For that, you so have therefore, to have legislation. No, no, you are absolutely correct, Richard. The question is the law in this. This is a special act, all right, and it is made specially for a particular purpose. And nowhere in the act does it say that you will have to wait. What it says is you can remove an organ from a person who is deceased. Deceased. in a cardio respiratory or in a brain stem sense and then you can remove the organ in whatever way now the question is brain stem death you have certified 
So he's brainstorm. There's no problem there. But there also you're waiting for him to be dead, not only dead, but dead, dead. And in a cardiac, you are waiting for him, to, you're, you're nitpicking. The guy is dead, but you're wanting a flat line. Now either you wait, but if you can't wait, then the fact of the matter is in your OT, you want him to take something in pristine condition. There is an overlap. You are withdrawing a certain amount of, you are not pumping the fellow full of oxygen before you move the organs. Yeah. You're technically withdrawing a certain support. Why do you want to go nitpicking about whether it's active euthanasia or passive euthanasia? You're taking the organ, the guy's dead. He's not going to wake up. And once you move the heart, in any case, the guy's going to be dead. So, you know, I mean, the point is, if you want to go into this de details, you know, he has been certified when and when the heart stopped beating and you tell the fellow when he's going to be reborn, then you are asking for trouble. So keep it simple. I personally believe once you have committed, the person has come to the OT, either you wait or you don't. It's like saying, you know, a lady is in labor. You know, I want to have dinner somewhere, so I go and go cesarean. Or otherwise, you wait for the natural labor. So which one do you want to go for? And Rich has promised to support us, so this will be all right. No <laughs> but she will say she will go to the <laughs> We are okay there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's do only the last one that is for Arjna. The recipient, you know, there was a recipient on the list. And he refuses to take the we rang him up and he says, sorry, I can't come. I'm, you know, he makes some excuse, gone out of station, no one at home, no one to bring me, or something, don't have money, blah, blah, blah. Where does he stand on the list? Can you just keep pampering him? You know, next time again, the organ comes, we still give it to him. Where does Noto stand? He had refused once, maybe refused twice. What do we do with him? This has happened. I, I, this is a practical issue. Actually, uh, registry is uh, presently not fully automated. So, And the status of the patient is maintained by the hospital itself. So yeah. in the follow-up, if you're talking to the patient and you find that he is not much interested or he is not he, he don't uh, he's not really want to go for the transplant then you have to you know make it clear by the science and the by the art that whether he really wants you can ask him that you want to be in the list or not because if yeah. you ask us if you send the request we will definitely go ahead and uh, presently we look for that uh, registration number so if uh, as per the registration number he is in seniority we will definitely <laughs> offer him and if you update that he is not coming we will offer the second priority person yeah. we so don't have any next, no next time again he will still be on top you know we are yes. fed up with this guy twice we until unless you put him in the status not active, suspended, yeah, yeah. not willing to uh, do the transplantation presently. Right. Like that. So the hospital have that power to, you know, make him inactive or something. Yep. Yeah. But with the consent of the patient, he should <laughs> not again get a letter and say, thing less than somehow hospital have changed my status and I'm no, no more in the list. You are talking Richard's language. So anyway, it doesn't matter. No, sir. Uh, always, this is a science and an art which we are doing. So we have to be get yes, but with the conviction and with the art of saying. Yeah, this is Richard's language. Say. This is total Richard language. Okay. So we all have to adopt to this. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, these are a couple of cases. You know, somebody became brain red, getting restrain order from court. This is some, some one of friend, friends of Richard's must have done that. You know, patient is brain dead. You get an order from court. I really, I don't know what we can do with, uh, with, with lawyers. It's hard to get neurosurgeon and intensivist to get him declared brain dead. <laughs> How you will go to the court? Okay. Now I come to thank you, but I wanted to ask finally, uh, Archana, what initiatives are in the offing uh, for you, from you guys, to increase the what is what what is going on from Noto side to increase our organ donation? Can you? Noto I know is one thing. In all one, one thing you did was very good was doing those courses for the intensivists. Anything more? No, we uh, it's not that the, only those two trainings. We will be continuing that. Uh, Pan India and for repeated trainings for the Delhi and CR region. Yeah. And then we are doing a public awareness session. We have we will be starting tomorrow uh, awareness session in 
um, Indian Institute of Home Economics, Delhi College, and our plan is to educate all the colleges of Delhi regarding organ donation and transplantation. Then we are working on the implementation part also. We will be we will be shortly working with Niti Aayog uh, on transportation of organs to make it faster, to make it cheaper. Yeah. NOTP is also developing guidelines to make it more affordable. We recently had a workshop with Mohan Foundation on affordability, where Sir was also there. Yeah. So yeah. we are working in all dimensions, and we think that all together we will definitely be able to success, achieve success in increasing disease donation and implementation of the program Pan India. Yeah, and maybe increase your retrieval center as much as you possibly can. Yes, we have a plan of you no know, uh, training the retrieval surgeon surgeons. Actually, one retrieval center in Ahmedabad, that is Civil Hospital Ahmedabad, is doing a very good job. They yeah. have recent within the six months they have done almost seventy donations. Wow! So you must, we you are, must applaud them. Put it in the press. Yes, yes, yes. So hmm. we are planning to send a few representatives or the nodal officer of these NTORCs at least to uh, yeah. go visit, be there for a week's time learn how they are doing it and then they can come back and start great great thank you very much guys it was wonderful having you all on board. thank you and uh, anybody has to say anything go ahead otherwise it's over to dr uh, rara krishnan thank you thank you dr wada and team for the excellent deliberation I request Dr. Belji Singh to give a formal word of thanks to this team. Thank you so much, sir. It was uh, so interesting a webinar. Time just flew. I mean, uh, there was so uh, the topics were so interesting, and I must compliment Dr. Vijay Vora for bringing out the best from uh, the speakers. Although the time was much less, uh, I wish there was some more time. Uh, Dr. Prachi Gop uh, Gopala uh, that dealt with the various issues of uh, brain death certification and uh, beautifully done. And thereafter, Dr. Seema Balotra uh, on the management of brain death, uh, brain death donor. And the formula that she mentioned at the end was a, a very uh, important take home message a formula of 100, which Dr. Vijayvara also had mentioned. And before that, she had highlighted uh, the, the growing gap between the availability of the organs and the need for the uh, organs. So that gap is increasing. I think we, uh, we must do something about it uh, at, at, at the society level. And uh, thereafter, again, uh, some uh, the issues uh, which we often ignore uh, with regard to the law and the legal issues. And Dr. Harsh Zori, uh, had very clearly mentioned that we have to, uh, you know, know these. We have to learn these uh, laws and various issues related to that. And following that, a very interesting and a very uh, pleasant discussion between uh, all the participants. Uh, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Ms. Richa Singh was added and uh, uh, Ms. Achana Kumari was also there. And, uh, you know, uh, everyone uh, brought out the intricacies of uh, issues related to this, uh, whether it's brain death or it's a cardiac death, whether it's active euthanasia or passive euthanasia. Dr. Harshiori was very, very categorical with one line statements. Okay, the person is either dead or he's not, forget it. <laughs> you know, keep matters simple. You know, uh, the active euthanasia, passive euthanasia, don't, don't go into that. So it is it is uh, just euthanasia. Anyway, uh, and uh, although uh, the legal eagles were saying that, yes, we must follow the process of law, that of course we must, uh, otherwise our neck will be uh, in trouble. So uh, friends, it was a very, very interesting uh, webinar. I wish we had some more time. We already have step, over step time, but uh, we enjoyed, I think at least I enjoyed every moment of uh, the whole uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Dr. Vijay Vora, uh, in the end for, uh, for moderating it so beautifully. And on behalf of the president and the entire executive of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank each and every speaker and uh, Dr. Vijay Vora for uh, such uh, interesting and such an informative webinar. Thank you so much and good night to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Clarinet. And you. our anger. Thank you. Yeah. The world has a card. Thank you very much. Good night to all. Thank you. Good thank night. you, sir. Thank you so much. So we are closing thank you. here. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Uh, good night. Thank you very much.